If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Romans with me tonight, please. Chapter 4. Romans. Chapter number 4. Romans chapter 4. And verse number 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Father, I pray, Lord, now you bless your holy word as it goes forth. Bless the messenger. Give me unction tonight. Give me the gift of teaching. I pray, Father, it fall upon ears that want to hear and hearts that want to believe and receive your holy word. In thy name I pray, Lord, and amen. You can be seated. Uh, has been said so many times, the book of Romans is the, uh, the Magna Carta when it comes to all the great doctrines of the Bible, especially as they relate to salvation. The book of Romans lays it out as clearly as any book in the New Testament. The book of Romans starts out with the glory of God and how that uh, he is absolute and beside him there is none other. Then it goes into the, uh, the apostasy and the corruption that falls upon the Gentiles and they did not like to retain God in their knowledge so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. When you read the first chapter of the book of Romans there's no doubt that you probably think good night that's America. It is America. And you ain't seen nothing yet. It's just started. You wait until they really uh, unplug this thing and you see the depravity of the Gentile nations and the depravity of this nation. It's unbelievable at what's coming. And you can see, you can see precur precursors of it in Germany, for example, where they have, uh, they have buildings, they have places dedicated to bestiality, the kind of thing that would absolutely Im would shock your mind out of existence. I watched a commentary yesterday on Vladimir, Vladimir Putin in Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church is the major church in Russia. They're celebrating over a thousand years of Christianity in Russia. Uh, Putin is giving speech after speech. He's meeting with the religious leaders of the nation, and they're, uh, and they're talking. He's talking about the alliance between government and religion, and that, uh, that, the, that the government needs the church to support it, and the church needs the government, and the two of them working hand in hand. Uh, he talks about the depravity of the West, and of course he's making reference to Europe and he's making reference to America. He's talking about how that the West has sold its soul and that uh, it has become uh, morally offensive and it is a godless society. Now however much of this is for political expediency, I do not know. It's not my place tonight to try to, uh, I'm certainly not trying to exalt Vladimir Putin, but I would like for you to expand your mind. I would like for you to look beyond the shores of America and you might be surprised at the Christianity that does exist in this world. Uh, I told you about those girls over there in Iraq that faced certain death if they, if they didn't deny the Lord Jesus and they did not deny him and they died. I wonder how many American Christians would go that far. Now think about that because we'll go to the judgment seat, the Bema, and one day give an account for, for the kind of thing that just happened there. And then of course in Mosul, in Iraq, an old Christian, an old Christian uh, town, been there for 2,000 years practically. Uh, you have them scattered all over the world. Whether all of these are genuine Christians or not, it's not my place to judge them. Uh, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. That's the scriptural mandate, 1 John chapter number 5. If you have the Son, you're a Christian. If you don't have the Son, you're not. I don't care who you are, what church you belong to, what denomination, how many, how many uh, medals you've got hanging from your chest, accolades been given you, how high you are in your hierarchy, what a big wig you are to the people around you, that's irrelevant. If you have the Son, you have life. If you have not the Son, you have not life. And it's that, it's that simple. Now, how, how do I have the Son? You believe on the Son. This is what the Bible's talking about in the book of Romans, chapter 4. Abraham believed God. Now that's a simple thing, but it's profound. Because the relationship that Abraham had with God was based solely upon believing what God told him. He believed the word that God gave him. Now it's hard in our intellectual, narcissistic, uh, highbrow society today to believe anything. 
And that's exactly what Satan intends to do because nobody believes anybody. Let that settle in. We're all, this, this nation is full of liars. Uh, if, you want to see, if you want to see accomplished liars, go to Washington, D.C. Amen. Amen. You'll see a full-blown entourage of accomplished liars. That's right, Democrat and Republican. You'll find it in Washington, D.C. So it is a nation of liars where nobody trusts, uh, nobody trusts anybody. And this is exactly what Satan wants. And when, you've, and, when you, and when your mind is brainwashed like that, you open the Bible and begin to read it, and you think, well, can I believe this? How many times has somebody said, it was just written by men? But the Bible says of itself, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed. This is God's book to mankind. This is God's word. This is God speaking to us. Either we believe it or we don't believe it. Now the Holy Ghost will have you believe it. And when you refuse to believe it, then you've grieved the Holy Spirit and he'll withdraw from you. But if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart, he'll cause you to believe the Bible. Not doubt it, but believe it. Do you know what the first sin that man committed on the face of this earth? I'm not talking about the first sin, but the first sin man committed on this earth, unbelief. Unbelief led to murder. Murder led to rebellion. Murder and, and rebellion led to the angels of heaven fall into the earth. It led to the destruction of the first world, the antediluvian world. All of this was based upon one simple thing, unbelief. Unbelief of what? God. Yea, hath God said, Satan said to our parents in the garden. Yea, hath God said. In plain words, Satan is going to contend, challenge what God said. So you have a choice to make. You either believe Lucifer or you believe God. Romans chapter number 4 makes it very clear that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. When someone has simple Bible-believing faith, it opens up doors for your life that nothing else can. It gives you victory and freedom. It gives you joy. It puts spring in your step. You shout and rejoice because you believe God. And you say to yourself, God said it, that's good enough. There's no need for any more. God said it. If I believe the Bible. Now if I'm the devil, I'm going to cause, cause you to doubt the Bible. And I'm going to multiply Bibles to the point where you don't know which one is the Bible. That's what I'm going to do. But it's an amazing thing when you watch these people that come out of the secular world. Just watch them. They have no religious training, no religious background. So therefore they don't have all of this preconceived ideas. And just watch them when they get saved. And observe them as they get closer and more genuine and their faith is purified, it is an amazing thing to watch them come to the King James Bible. That's remarkable. That's quite remarkable to see that happen. Now, I'm not saying all of them do that, but I'm saying an awful lot of them do because they're led by the Holy Ghost and they want some power. And they pick up a book and they read it. They want a book that's got power in it. Now, I'm going to ask you a simple question tonight. And, you know, you don't have to answer me personally, but you have to answer God. Do you believe this book is perf perfect? Perfect. Do you believe the Bible is inspired, infallible? Which one? You've got to be able to pick up a book in your hand and say, I believe that book right there. I believe that book. I believe that's God's infallible word. I do. Now, you may not. A lot of people don't. You say, can you be a Christian and not believe that? Yes, you can. You can be a Christian. Uh, every Christian, regardless of who you are tonight and where you are in life, you're on a journey. You started on a faith journey. And that faith journey you started on is, is, uh, has, has had many pitfalls. It has many challenges. It has, it has a few diversions to get you off track. And Satan is going to fight you at every victory you win in that faith journey. You can be sure of that. And one of the, and one of the most important things that you'll ever learn as a Christian is the book that you believe. That you say, I believe that book. I believe that's God's infallible word. If you ever do take a stand in your life and say, I believe God's word is perfect, that becomes the foundation of your faith because what God said is all important. And Abraham believed God. Simple thing. Now that word believe is a big deal. There's a lot of different words in the Bible translated believe. A common word in the New Testament translated believe is pistuo. So what does that mean? That means to embrace with the heart, to embrace with the soul, the message and the word that's been given to you. It doesn't, has nothing to do with intellectual 
assent. You can read a mathematics book and, and believe, uh, you know, this is the formula for this and the formula for that and this and that and so forth. That's fine. But that doesn't do anything for your soul. To embrace the scripture, embrace the word of God, to embrace the message of Christ, pistuo, is to receive him, is to pull him into your being. That's what that word means. That's what it means. That's what Christianity is about. That's what saving faith is about. Saving faith is reaching out and taking hold of somebody at their word and saying, I have no hope without you. I'm going to take what you said about me for face value. I'm not going to trust anything else. Anything else is a liar. I'm going to take you, Lord, and pull him into your being and embrace him in your soul. That's saving faith. But that gets deeper as you pass on in life, and it gets greater and expands, and you can see more and understand more because the Holy Spirit leads you into from faith to faith, as it says in the New Testament. So Abraham is the father of the faithful because Abraham believed God. All of us today who are children of God, if we believe in Christ, we're the children of Abraham. We are his children spiritually. This is what the book of Galatians is all about. The apostle Paul in the book of Galatians is dealing with Judaizers who try to drag them back under the law. He said, how is it that you began in the spirit and now you're perfected in the flesh? It won't work. You started in the spirit, stay in the spirit. So the book of Galatians is that. And he talks about Abraham. The book of Romans talks about Abraham. Galatians talks about Abraham. The, the gospels talk about Abraham. The, the Jews said, Abraham is our father. The Lord Jesus said, if Abraham were your father, you'd believe of me, for he spoke of me. He prophesied of me. If you were really the children of Abraham, you'd be children of faith. That's what he said to these Jews. But they, didn't, they rejected him. And so Paul in the book of Galatians is dealing with Judaizers who's trying to drag people under the law. And he says, look, look. He said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. All it did was to condemn you and show you your need for someone greater than you. And if you believe, Paul said in the book of Galatians, you believe as Abraham did through his seed, one seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. You put your faith in him. So the apostle Paul here in Romans chapter number four says Abraham believed God. He believed him. Now, you know, I cannot make you believe. I can't get up here and give you a command, believe. And you think that's going to change anything? Drag you down to the altar and put you down and put my foot on the back of your neck as the, as the conqueror used to do and say, believe or command you to believe. That's a bunch of garbage. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith will never be any purer or stronger than the faith you have in the word of God. Abraham believed God. Eve did not believe God. And because Eve did not believe God, she brought death and destruction on all of mankind. Abraham believed him and came out of Ur of the Chaldees and became the father of the faithful. And he was a bright and shining light for all who followed. Salvation is not a mystical uh, enigma wrapped up in some kind of a darkened sentences that the church pronounces over it and it only allots it to certain people. Salvation is a clear message from God. In Romans chapter number 10, the word is nigh thee even in thy heart and in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. That word of faith, believe. And promises in verse number 13, Romans 10, for whosoever shall call out the door, five point Calvinist, enough of you, Hyper Calvinism, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, preacher, I don't know how much faith I had when I called. Preacher, I don't know how pure my faith was. Preacher, I'm not sure I meant it. Preacher, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm so confused. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that means? That means God will take your faith however weak it is. Smoking flax, bruised reed, makes no difference how shaky. He'll take that faith and nurture it and lead you into salvation. If the salvation doesn't come at that moment, it will come. If you follow on, you shall know if you follow on to know the Lord. If you're sincere in your heart that you want to know God, you will know God. Why? Because of his nature. 
That's his nature. He won't, he won't kick you aside, stomp on you, say you're not coming from the right church. Didn't say the right words. Didn't have the right tone in your voice when you prayed. I've heard that old rote prayer so many times. Pray something original. Garbage like that. All you have to say is, God save me. Lord save me. Or just save me. Or I'm lost. Help. You come to God and you come to him full of need. And God is there to answer Think about this for a moment. One who came into this world and laid aside the robes of glory and condescended to our estate and allowed himself to be nailed on a cross and suffered for six hours on that tree, a horrible, horrible death, and then descended into Hades itself. And then on the third day arose from the dead, went through all that. Don't you think he's going to take your feeble prayer and do something with it? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. You make a great error when you get somebody down on the altar and say, did you feel something? Have you prayed through? Did you know that uh, this happened to me or this happened to you and this and this and this and this and this? Listen, I'm not, I'm not the judge of all of human experience. There's an awful lot of things that can happen to a human being, but I know this. I know the heart that seeketh after God will find him. Ye will find him. And the Bible says in the book of uh, Hebrews 11, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and a he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now the seeking of God doesn't end at salvation. It only starts. <laughs> that's just the beginning. When you're born again, that just opens the door. And that's a wonderful thing. I would never diminish that. Thank God for the new birth. But that's the beginning. Then you spend a lifetime seeking God, seeking him learning more about him, trying to understand him. And you're only going to understand the, the infinite uh, in your finite mind to, to a limited degree. But anyway, that's all good, isn't it? Aren't you waiting? Don't you, want to be, don't you want to be surprised when you get to glory and the glory of that eternal, absolute, almighty being blast across your soul and you say to yourself, it was worth it. Oh, it was more than worth it. Oh, oh, I'm so glad I'm here. Hallelujah, God. I don't remember all those questions I had, and I don't care. Now I'm here, and that's all that matters. And you hear the angels singing, but you hear the redeemed on the top of them. And you see the glory of God and the families reunited. Little children and their moms and dads come together again. All the family circles that were broken are now reunited. Now in the presence of the Lord. And forever and forever and forever to shout the glory of God. And then the Bible says plainly, the pure in heart shall see God. They got that in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The pure in, the, the pure in heart shall see God. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. You can't know the Son without the Father. You can't know the Father without the Son. And the, and, the son, and the Father brings you to the Son in this world. The Son will take you to the Father in that world. And it'll take the Son to take you to the Father because the Son is the one who came forth from the Father. Hebrews chapter number 1. He is the light that shines forth from that invisible being. And that light that shone forth from that invisible being will turn around and shine on that invisible being. The Son will reveal the Father to creation. And then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Godhead, the blessed Godhead, will be manifest to his creatures, us, the born-again believers. That, to me, my dear friend, is heaven. That's what being saved is about. Amen. I heard a man today was a religious man, had all kinds of religious garb on, and looked to be very religious. Had crosses all over his, his clothing and everything like that. And he was talking pretty good about a lot of things, and then he got into religion, and he's talking about those people who are the born-again types. I thought to myself, what do you mean, born-again types? Son, you either born again or you're not. John 3 said, you must be born again, Nicodemus. You must be. It's not a choice. It's, it's, not, a, you know, it's not an alternative. It's an absolute. You must be born again. How can a man enter his mother's womb the second time be born? Nicodemus thinking strictly on physical terms. The Lord said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I'm not talking about going in your mother's womb. The second time, Nicodemus, I'm talking about a spiritual new birth. You must be born again. So be certain of this. Any man that makes disparaging statements about the new birth 
has never been born again. Because once you have, it's going to be on the tip of your tongue everywhere you go. The new birth, the new birth, the new birth. Born of the spirit of the living God. The message in Romans chapter number 4, Abraham believed God. Did you know that there's a gospel of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the word believe shows up at least six to seven times more than it does in the other gospels? It's all over that gospel. It's everywhere. In the first chapter all the way through the last chapter, it's in that gospel over and over and over and over and over again. I've got the number written down here. It's 99 times. One gospel has the word believe 11 times, one 15 times, one 9 times, and then one 99 times believe. Somebody tell me which one it is. Sure, you know. I've been up here rattling on here now for some time. You all ought to remember that. 99 times in the Gospel of John, the last Gospel written, probably 90 to 95 A.D., long after Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written. Written not to the Jews, but written to all of mankind. Every man. Not dealing with the Gospel of John. not dealing with the kingdom of heavens. not dealing with an earthly kingdom. It's dealing with the kingdom of God that can only be entered by the new birth, John 3. The Gospel of John is the only one of the four Gospels that says you must be born again. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say nothing about it. It's not that that's wrong. It's just that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is focusing on a different time and a different people. The Gospel of John is now looking into the future and looking into the Gentiles and Jews that need to be born again 99 times. That may tells me that the Gospel of John is written that you might believe. <laughs> Here's another one. In the book of Matthew, uh, 44 times, Mark five times, Luke 17 times, the word Father, the Father, the Father, in John 121 times. Boy, what a coincidence. That's no coincidence. The Holy Ghost wanted Father in John 121 times. Holy men of God spake as they were moved. Why does he have that? Because once you're born again, he becomes your Father by the new birth. Amen. Amen. You don't see a lot about the fatherhood of God in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is God's the father of Israel in the sense that he's the, he's the, he's the Lord of hosts. He's the God in heaven who's the father of all creation in that sense, but not in that personal sense. Once you're born again of the spirit of God, God becomes your spiritual father. And John's full of it from chapter 1 all the way through 22. There's another word that shows up in the gospel of John. More, far more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew has it five times, Mark seven, Luke five, but John 71 times. What word is that? Jews. <laughs> you know why? They are the enemy of the gospel of Christ. But according to Romans chapter number 11, they are the elect according to the mercy of God. They're the enemy of the gospel of Christ right now, but they're still the elect. So how can that be, preacher? They're blinded until Zion, until the Messiah roars out of Zion and salvation comes at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's remarkable, don't you think, that these kind of things show up? No, that you might know the word no. Matthew 28 times, Mark 26, Luke 42, John 117 times. Know how these things are written that ye might believe, know, and have everlasting life. John's got a reason for being in that Bible. Witness Matthew 1, Mark 3, Luke 3, John 47 times. The word witness shows up in the Gospel of John. That ought to be self-evident. Why? Because of the witness of the Holy Ghost of God. Have you noticed how the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Gospel of John in a different way than he is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that the Gospel of John, chapter number 9, talks about a man born blind, and that man that is born blind is healed when he goes where? What happens to him? Somebody tell me the story. How did he get healed of his blindness? John 9. What did the Lord do? He made a spittle of what? Mud. That's where man came from. He came from the dust of the ground. He covered that over the eyes. That represents the curse. 
The man is blind now with a curse on his eyes. He goes down and washes in a pool. Which pool is that? Siloam. The waters of Shiloh that flow softly in the Old Testament. And the moment that he washed in the pool of Siloam, he washed away the mud. And the Bible said he could see. Did you know what the word Siloam means? That's right. Somebody said it. Sent. Sent. That's what an apostle is. Apostello. He's a sent one. Sent. This water was sent. This water represents the Holy Spirit. Sent. Who opens the eyes of the blind that they might see. Now I just listened to a 28 minute testimony of a woman that was in the new age. And I don't listen to a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, because I've, I've, I've listened and read so much stuff, but I listened to this woman because I knew she had something different. She lives in New York. She's a new age guru. She had a following of 50,000 people on her blog site. She was the teacher. She was an instructor in the new age movement. She's coming to Temple Baptist Church June the, whatever that first Sunday is in, the fourth, she's bringing a friend with her from New York. They're just coming to visit here at the church, and they'll be here from New York the first Sunday in June. Her testimony is remarkable. It is remarkable because what she said about where she came from, how she was raised, what she did, what she believed, how she practiced as a New Age guru is exactly what I've been preaching and teaching in here for years it's, but when I hear it come from the mouth of someone like that, firsthand, a primary witness like that, it does something for you. I thought this is, I just finished listening to that too, right before the service tonight. I recorded it. And I thought, you know, a lot of people need to hear this. You need to hear what this woman had to say. It, it's just, you need to hear it. You need to hear the way she saw things. But what I was interested in the most was how did you come out of it? How did you come out of this? What happened to you? You know what she said? She said, I began to see Lucifer for what he really is. And once I started to see him for what he is, other things started opening up for me. It's like she was coming out, and as she came out, God gave her more and more and more. You shall know if you follow on to know. And now there's no doubt in my mind she's a born-again believer. If you'd like to listen to her testimony, you can. Her name is Jennifer K-A-S-S. -S. Just type that into Google. 28 minutes long. Jennifer K-A-S-S. -S. You'll find, if you do a Google on her, you'll find her as a New Age guru, and then you'll find her as a born-again believer. You'll find her, and this is no more than over a year ago, you'll find her as a New Age guru, 50,000 people following her on her, on, her, on, her, uh, on her blog, and then you'll find her renouncing all of that stuff. This will help somebody in the church, and this is this in particular. She describes in detail, she's very good at describing in detail her journey out, her journey out, and, her, and, her, and, and how she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. She said that when she was in the New Age, she believed in Jesus, but it wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a different Christ. How many times have I told you that? How many times have I told you about a universal life force? How many times have I told you that the, that the evolutionist who rejects the creationism or the creator, but he will say, you have to you pin his ears against the wall, ask him two questions. They, no, there's not an evolution on the face of this earth that can answer these two questions. Question number one, define life. Shut up, he doesn't have a clue. Question number two, question number two. You tell me that there is no designer designing all of this, and here's what he'll tell you. He'll say, there's a universal life force. He said, there's come something we can't, it's, he said, it, it's unclear about exactly what it is, but there's some kind of a life principle or life force out there 
that's doing this designing, he has to admit there's something going on. How many of you noticed lately there's a lot of difference between you and a worm? <laughs> you ever wonder why? You ever wonder why? I've done a little reading about the human heart since I've had a little problem with mine. The upper section has what's called atrium. It's got two of them. Bottom section called ventricles. Atrial fibrillation is what I had, okay? The top of my heart, the left atrium quivered a little bit. That's, a vent that's fibrillation, okay? That's not normally fatal. Not normally. They put a pacemaker in. They, I'm on medication. That's supposed to help keep this from fibrillating. But the lower part of your heart can have ventricle fibrillation. And ventricle fibrillation can take you out of this world in minutes. It is very dangerous and can be fatal. And I know some Christians that have died with ventricle fibrillation, the lower chambers of the heart. You've got a node up here at the top of the heart that fires and tells the heart when to fire. It's called the sinus node. It's in the right atrium, firing the heart, firing the heart. It tells it when to beat. But did you know that the two bottom chambers of the heart also have a secondary firing that takes place that is synced with the first firing? First has to fire at the top, then the part in the bottom has to fire in order for the bottom to pump out what comes in at the top. You see, you can't have the top pumping out at the same time it's coming in. So there's a synchronization that takes place there. For just a moment, the blood comes in at the top, and then synchronized, goes out the bottom. And if that gets out of sync, you can get in trouble. Not necessarily fatal, but you get in trouble. Now tell me something, dear friend. Now just a little bit of limited knowledge this Baptist preacher has of how the heart functions. You think that just happened? Of course not. But when you deal with a, with a Darwinian, you're dealing with somebody who absolutely rejects the mind. And he just believes by blind faith that there's some kind of a universal life force out here that is, that is, that is, that is, that is somehow or another that is causing all of this beautiful, intricate creation to come about. Let him explain it to you sometime. Put him, on the, put him on the line. Well, I believe in evolution. What is evolution? Define it. That's the point. I believe in creation. The Lord God Almighty, let there be. There is. Because he said it. He's the creator. Bara. To bring into existence from nothing. But you see, here's the point. They believe in the same thing that the occult world believes because the occult world believes in a universal life force. Now, he, the professor over here at UT in the chair of anthropology or whatever uh, uh, muckety-muck he is, if you told him that he believed the same thing that an occultist believed, he would be highly offended with you. But I'm telling you right now, he does. And I challenge him to show me otherwise. He believes the same thing. He may word it in a different way. But he rejects that eternal, absolute, almighty creator who brought into being by speaking everything into being. And he had rather have this, this, this mystical life force that is designing and creating and bringing into existence and evolving as it goes. Folks, have you got your thinking head on tonight? Have you got your faculties? How many of you think you're in your good, how many think you got a good mind? You're in your right mind tonight. If you are, there's no way you could ever accept evolution. That's a religion. That's the worst garbage that's ever been uh, fostered on anybody. That's horrible. It's junk. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, in their mind, God gave them over to a, a dokimos, a reprobate mind. And that's exactly what's walking around out here, and they think they're smart, and they've been given over to a reprobate mind. They don't believe. They're infidels. I believe. Hallelujah. 
You know how my heart came into being? God said, let there be. Didn't take a whole lot of time with it. But when he brought my soul into my body, he reached down and picked up my head and breathed into my nostrils his breath, and I became a living soul. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to kick me out of the old boys club tonight. That's okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely, brother. Like you said, they don't want to acknowledge God because they don't want to give accountability to God. Oh, well, that's the key. That's the point. That's the reason. That's the motive. Absolutely. Sure he does. But the motive is that they don't want to be accountable. That's the motive. Absolutely. All right, I'm done. Are you a believer? I'm a believer. <laughs> Remember when I was a kid? Right before they laid the switch on, they go, go down at that tree down there and, and tear off a, a limb. Now I thought to myself, that limb's for me. <laughs> I better find me a small limb. <laughs> and when I brought that limb back up there, they gave me a whipping, and here's what they said. I'm going to make a believer out of you. <laughs> How many of you ever heard that? <laughs> they make a believer out of you, boy. <laughs> That was child abuse. No, they weren't killing each other back then like they are now. No, no, no. All right, we'll take your prayer request tonight.